Hey guys, it's David here, and I'm wearing a beanie inside my own house because the heater's too loud to run during a video and it's freezing cold in here. Anyway, a couple months ago, Instagram decided to finally take all the data it's been collecting from me and actually put it towards showing me some cool ads of things I actually care about instead of just dumping weird Etsy products down my throat. And the product it decided to advertise to me was a card game called Cycles of Moss. They were doing their own pre-order style campaign, so I decided to check it out and I ended up ordering the collector's edition of the game. Did I have room in my life for another trading card game? Probably not. But 16 booster packs and 176 cards later, here we are. From the moment the package arrived though, I knew I'd made the perfect spur of the moment decision because Tim Kaminsky's art is mind blowing. From the beautiful landscapes to the epic swords, to the adorable cats. So adorable. I was sold. The game was fun, it was easy to learn, and I could build a couple decks and toss them in my bag to play later with friends on the go. I also immediately knew that I wanted to do a video to go over the whole game with you guys, but I wanted to spice it up a bit. So, I went to the source. The Cycles of Moss thing kind of came out of a little bit of, uh, about 10 years ago, I started building a universe or world. I had like a temporary name for it, I called it Shattered. And from there, I kind of put that on pause and I met Trace a few years back uh, when I moved to LA. And that kind of led to um, sort of the original inspiration of this, where we had this world and all this art to kind of pull from. And we're like, oh, what could we, what could we do from, with this? Could we make a game based off that? I think it was actually originally Trace's idea. We started Studio Beetle about July of uh, 2021. You know, we talked for a long time about like, all right, what can we do together? What what can our joint brains can do? Tim has all this art, and you know, we were just like, all right, let's let's sell something. You know, let's let's make some products out of this art. So we started with art prints. We moved to desk mats and mouse pads, and then our current project, Cycles of Moss, is the trading card game. I've played games my whole life. But like I have no training as far as like game development. It's sort of just a, t Tim will agree, you know, it's uh, that I have a natural knack for it. You know, just have a lot of fun with it too. So how do you play Cycles and Moss? You might be wondering. Well, let me give you the rundown. There's two modes, casual and standard, but both start the same way with deck building. Each deck consists of 15 cards in total, three from each of the five different star rankings. After you played for a while, you'll likely start building a general strategy of which cards you want in your deck, but to start with, just pick which art you like best and build a deck from those. It's that simple. That's honestly all I did. To start the game, players choose either red or blue as their color. Then each player chooses five cards from their deck to start the first round, one of each ranking. The goal of the game is to control the most of your color on the board at the end of each round, and you do this by flipping your opponent's cards. Now here's where the numbers at the top of the card come in. In casual mode, players take turns placing one card at a time anywhere on a 3x3 grid. If you choose to place a card directly adjacent to an opponent's card, both players roll one six-sided die and add that value to their number closest to the opponent's card. If the turn player ends up with the highest number, they flip their opponent's card. If not, no cards are flipped. If the place card is adjacent to two or more opponent cards, the turn player decides which order the attacks take place. The player that goes second will of course have one card left in their hand, which counts as a card they control. Now, while this mode is obviously fairly simple, the real fun comes in playing standard mode. In standard mode, most of the casual rules remain the same. Each number comes with its own ability. Things like automatically winning you battles against specific numbers, letting you look at your opponent's cards, or even flipping cards in a chain, setting off a cascade of abilities down the line, allowing you to turn the tide of a game in one fell swoop. Now, of course, that was just a quick summary of the rules, so if you end up picking up the game and you really wanna know the ins and outs of it, I'll leave a link in the description of the actual rulebook. That's probably enough of me talking for now, so let's get back to Tim and Trace to learn what went into creating Cycles of Moss. We definitely had an unconventional approach to deciding to make a game. Most times people are like, oh, I wanna make a game and let's create the art and the world around it. Um, with us, it was, all right, Tim has this catalog of art, you know, that he's done throughout his career. He's built this amazing world with these uh, incredible fantasy landscapes. And we were like, okay, how can we make his art collectible? The unconventional approach too is sort of the idea that the, the world existed and we sort of inserted the game. The original world that I built was to be a game as well, but a different game. So I could almost see a path in the future where we have this game 
and then cycles of moss could exist in that game as well because it's kind of built into the universe as almost like you could play the game in a game and i was a big fan of the final fantasy series and in final fantasy 8 there's a game called triple triad and a lot of people will notice like oh this is similar to triple triad you know there's four numbers on a card you know they flip uh on on a, a three by three grid um and so certainly a lot of similarities and that was kind of our starting point one of the big concepts that we wanted to do too for the game to kind of make it feel i think uh, uh like there's more of a challenge there and whatnot is having it so that it feels like you can really sway the the form of the combat and whatnot a lot of games i that i don't like that are board games are the ones where it feels like you're just doing the bidding of the dice like monopoly or something perhaps and i that was one of i think that was one of the thoughts we had there was really wanted to make it feel kind of active and like if you were losing or going in a particular direction you could really shift the the tide of the combat. Other uh, trading card games like uh, Hearthstone or Magic, you know, there's a there's a big RNG element, and so we wanted to limit the RNG to like, okay, this is manageable. I'm I'm still coming in with my approach, and the RNG doesn't like completely derail my my strategy going into any particular match. So one of the original ideas for this world was I wanted to create a fantasy sci-fi world that felt more fantasy than sci-fi, but still felt like it had like digital or some sort of other kind of uh, technology or something kind of layered on top of it. The sort of base layer of inspiration is going outside in nature. I used to draw birds a lot when I was a kid, and that kind of helped me understand nature side. And then as I got older, I started playing more video games, and those kind of got me in thinking about like the adventuring and fantasy worlds. There was Riven and Mist, which were these kind of point click adventure games that were all about world building and atmosphere, but it was just still frames basically. And then you'd like, you could like move around and grab stuff. So it was like a puzzle game basically, but with lots of atmosphere and world building, kind of a recognizable fantasy that feels believable. Things should feel really like weighted and old if they are old and you really feel the materials and things like that. The game's reception was actually went quite well. It was actually better than I sort of expected. I figured it was going to be kind of more of a slow trickle and so I kind of get things out that way. But we we worked with some people on TikTok and combined with my uh, social media account and kind of did our own campaign to sort of get it out there for people to do pre-orders. I was like, oh, you know, I'll be able to pack all of the all of the orders in like a weekend or something, right? I was like, okay, that'll be fine. All of the orders get here and it is a mountain of cards and mats and materials. It took weeks of just packing. Was definitely not anticipated and probably we'll figure out, you know, a better solution for <laughs> if we have such a reception in the future. But uh, yeah, it was, you know, incredible uh, problem to have, so. We had a, a packing party where we invited people over and they all were helping packing. We thought that would kind of take the bulk of the chunk out. So it was really awesome just to have people volunteer their time there. Uh, it, it barely hit 10. Hey guys, me again. I just want to take a chance to shout out our own trading cards. That's right. If you didn't know, we released our own set of artist trading cards featuring 11 different artists. Each pack contains 13 cards in total with a full art print on the front and an artist bio on the back. Proceeds from the pack help support the artists involved as well as help us to make merch for other future up and coming artists. So if you want to pick up a pack for yourself or that artsy friend you still haven't bought a Secret Santa gift for for some reason, I'll go ahead and leave a link in the description below. Also, if you could leave a like and subscribe to our channel, that would mean a lot to me because that lets me know that you want to keep seeing more fun stuff like this. Now. Back to the video. I don't remember what it's called, but it's the the floating cube, the hypercube one. Probably my favorite one. Uh, existential hypercube. Yes, the existential yes. hypercube. I, I yes. do love. I love that because it just like perfectly matches the kind of vibe of the like the numbers, the all around ones that have the you know cascade ability. So the the funny thing about that one too is it actually was April Fool's joke painting that I made. It was popular for quite a while where it's like upload your painting at a fast pace, just watch it as a speed paint. So it's like oh you get to see someone paint a painting within like five minutes that took maybe two or three hours to paint and with the uh, existential hypercube that was uploaded as a slow paint on april fool's day and it was a i think it took maybe like an hour or something or i can't remember how long the original painting was but i took the uh, whole thing and stretched it out to about five hours maybe yeah i think my favorite card has got to be the time beetle card uh so me and tim do a youtube show called maestro and moron where Tim is the maestro and I am the moron because I can't draw at all. It's it's bad. So I, I'll come up with an idea where I'm drawing a concept. And in this case, it was the time beetle. I gave Tim the prompt, you know, time beetle. I drew my my version of it. And then, you know, Tim goes in and, you know, makes it a masterpiece. So I, I got to be able to participate in creating. So I, I like that one. The cat cards is interesting, too, because those are they're based off of my pet Miso, although he's, he's passed away since now. But uh, so 
they hold a, a dear place in my heart as well. The current pack is actually themed. It, it's called uh, Swords and Tomes. So you'll notice there's a lot of swords and books, you know, in in the uh, in this pack. And you know, all of the swords are very strong in the up and right like numbers um, because they're all all of the swords are facing that way. And I think that is one of the unique things that we added to the game that hasn't been done before is that the art does correlate with the numbers on the card. For instance, the cats kind of sit in the top right corner and they kind of peer down over the board uh, and the books are well-rounded. And so the, you'll notice that all of the, the numbers on the books are, you know, kind of not equal, but close to equal, you know, as much as possible. One, one uh, I haven't actually talked about this with Trace yet, but one area that I would like to kind of expand on and maybe have more of a themed pack around would be the kind of corrupted nebulas. There's one corrupted nebula card, I think that's out there. I would actually like to take that and kind of build that out a bit more and kind of uh, get a little bit more, more lore out there of what those are, where they come from, and kind of uh, maybe have a pack centered around that. And I definitely would love to do a, a cat-centered pack, so. I mean, I'm really excited to kind of expand on the type of characters that we can add to it. Well, more characters, more items, more art. I really feel like it can kind of help expand the world. I would also like to think about ways that maybe we can tie in some more like written lore or something to kind of pull some interest in that level too. I have a lot of the stories, but you know, a lot of them are in the background. You don't really see them, but you can start seeing some of the connections between different cards and different areas. And it's been really fun to see some of the people come back and start noticing some of those small connections and it's built in behind them. I just want to say thank you to, you know, everyone who has supported, backed uh, Cycles of Moss, uh, who made an order, who's given feedback, who's play tested. You know, we're excited to, you know, work on the next set and see what's what's next. It's been just amazing journey and I'm really excited to share more art for these games. I think we have a whole other pack of stuff that we can start working on. Looking forward to the future of the project. A big thanks to Tim and Trace for taking time out of their day to answer my random DMs to be in this video. I hope to possibly do more casual interview style videos like this in the future as they don't require me to travel and film for days, which obviously is expensive and time consuming and makes it so I can't get as many videos out to you guys as I would like. Anyway, that's it. We're done here. I don't know who needs to hear it, but go to bed. You look tired. What are you doing up? Go to, go to bed. Go to bed.